This topic, uh, talking about technology, is huge. It's so, so important for us uh, as parents and uh, as families to, to be informed, to know um, how to have these conversations and how our families um, should, what, what our plan should be, how we should view technology. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's so important for us and uh, I commend you and applaud you for, for taking this time um, to think through these things because technology is everywhere. This is the world that we live in. Uh, your, your kids, so does everybody have kids that are elementary age in here that are what, first through fifth grade probably uh, if they're at VBS. And, um, your, your kids are growing up as digital natives. It's the, it's the air that they breathe, it's the language that they speak. Um, they, they are never going to know a time when there wasn't iPhones and iPads and uh, you know, touch screens and cameras everywhere. That, that, that's just the way that they, that's the way that they're gonna view the world and the way that they're gonna, they're, that they're gonna grow up. And so as Christians, as, as followers of Christ, we must um, have a plan for our families and, and we have to have thought through technology in some way um, in, in, in order to um, rightfully disciple our, our families and to help them help our kids uh, love and follow Jesus for the rest of our, our, their lives, which is what we're after. Um, so we have to have thought through these issues, which is what we're going to do a little bit together today. And we have to have a plan for our family and for our kids that's going to honor the Lord. And um, I will say from the outset that uh, families that handle technology the best that I've seen um, are countercultural. Okay? It's to handle technology in a way um, that is going to be best for our family is probably not going to look like what the rest of the world is doing. Um, and that, that's, that's going to be difficult. That will probably cause some difficult conversations with our kids that might not make them super happy whenever we don't let, you know, give them an iPad all hours of the day whenever they ask for it. Um, that, that's going to be more difficult because that might be what everybody else is doing. But as Christians, uh, we have to have some boundaries and a plan in place for us uh, when it comes to technology. We have to have a we have to impose a biblical worldview. We have to, we have to take, um, we have to take our Christianity. We have to take our our way of thinking, and we have to impose it on technology, instead of just letting technology happen uh, to us. Um, so there are two texts that I want to to shape um, our our time together, and uh, the the two you you know both of these very well. Um, but I think that they can give us a bit of a um, a uh, filter and a lens through which to view uh, uh, having this conversation. So the first is Deuteronomy six, and it's uh, four through nine. Obviously, this is uh, what is called the the Shema, and it's uh, come on in, guys. And it's um, and it's uh, it's the call to the the parents of of Israel, God's people, to and and how they are to to raise their kids. And verse five says, "You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might." And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And here's where, here's where it goes. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So that's Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. That is um, encouraging the, the parents of the children of Israel uh, to talk about the things of God essentially all the time. Uh, everywhere we go, when you, when you rise up, when you lie down, when you walk by the way, etc., etc. I mean, essentially it encompasses all of our time um, as the people of God that we should be and can be um, helping shape our kids in the knowledge of, of the Lord. Um, so everything 
um, should go along that way. And then you know the other one, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, is the, is the Great Commission. And uh, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. So one thing I always like to say um, to our, our parents and families is that the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations um, it is true that it's a, it's a missionary text, but it certainly includes those that are in our very own household, primarily. Uh, so we want to make disciples of our kids, and we can do that from a very, very young age as well. So those, those two texts, um, I think, should can, and can help us filter our use of technology and to help us have a reference point um, and uh, those could maybe bring us some diagnostic questions when it comes to our use of technology in the home and what we allow our kids to have etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so te technology in and of itself is is it good is it bad um, you know there there's plenty of debate about whether it's you know there it is inherently evil or whatever and the more I'm on Facebook the more I would say that it's inherently evil because I don't know what good can come from social media sometimes uh, but we know that that technology in and of itself is not evil um, and um, but um, it's how we use it um, that makes it good or bad but we are always being shaped by the things that we're using um, so just simply by by having the phone and using it even if I'm using it positively it's always it's always shaping me um, and so we we have to think about that with our kids our little ones um, that their, their use of technology is always shaping them in some way um, you know there there are plenty of educational ways and positive ways to use technology um, and and we can think through some of those but we have to know that using technology in our families and with our kids it's always shaping them in some way um, so let's uh, there's some people around around your tables here let's let's brainstorm let me hear some ideas what are some ways that your family can use technology that are good anything come up off the top of your head yeah by listening devotional uh -huh. in my case uh, at night I, uh, I listen to devotional yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, so good, yeah, good content. Uh, right, so that's, that's great. We have, a, we have access to all kinds of good biblical teaching and devotionals that are at our fingertips all the time. That's a great, that's a great use of technology. Any, anything else, any other good uses of technology that you found uh, with, your, with your family and your kids? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, sure, no doubt. So, Alec, if you would repeat some of those, so that way the people watching it later. Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, we had um, use of devotionals uh, at night with with the kids to to put on a, a podcast or watch a video uh, um, that is is biblical and, and centered and then we also had uh, positive as far as GPS and knowing where your kids are and um, and being able to track them those are those are good things listen to, to good music yeah amen yeah so uh, positive you know Christian Christian music worship music um, having that at our at our fingertips at all time those are all those are all good things that technology can bring um, what it what what might be some ways, let's think about the opposite then, what might be some ways um, that technology could be used negatively or not very well within our family? What would be some, what, what would be some dangerous things that you guys can think of? I would say an immediate thing is just um, there's so much information there, you need to filter it. So mm -hmm. It's uh, maybe inappropriate content for a younger age. No doubt. Yeah. So an immediate danger is the amount of is the amount of information that are at our fingertips on the internet, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about about that later. Um, I want to just touch on briefly the issue of, of pornography and, and, and that sort of thing. That but that's that's huge. What what are, what are maybe uh, one or two other negative things? Yeah. Video games. Uh huh. Okay.
let them play. Mm -hmm. But there's another video game that took too much attention. Yeah. Too much time. Uh-huh. So for me it's like that too. Great. Yes. yes. Great. So, so uh, she said she said video games that are being used too much or too often. Hey, come on in, guys. Yeah. Uh, video games that um, can be addictive that they spend too much time on is definitely is definitely can be a, a negative thing. Um, privacy. Okay. Yeah. Privacy. I have a kid that older girls have. A iPhones out one day she was doing FaceTime showing the house and they were all showing each other pools on who was the cool, coolest pool mm. and uh, it created like and I said why are you doing well their pool is nicer because it has all these functions and, uh, and I'm showing my pool and yeah. it would like create a lot of competition and, right. and, uh, and I said like, no no I mean so I, I controlled yeah. that I didn't even down on me wow it's like they do a lot of FaceTime they like okay mm -hmm. showing our whole, whole house yeah really, where do we like, no, yeah. So, pri yeah, privacy issues with FaceTime. Uh, yeah, I've never. Uh, mm hmm And yeah, which then leads to comparison. Yeah. Yeah. It leads to comparison and competition. Yeah. challenge or what kind of challenge you know there's a challenge to sometimes there are like dumb challenge like eating cookies or right but sometimes there are dangers yeah so for me that is also i think that we have to look at yes yeah so the content that they're that they're um taking in that we we're not even really sure what it is do you have something yeah uh-huh Uh huh. Dangerous. dangerous. Yeah, yeah. So with the with the internet, there's endless amounts of, of people uh, that they can get connected to without us knowing who they are. Yeah. I would say I know my challenge is their usage during dinner time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's normally a time where we sit around. Family and can connect. And yeah. Talk to each other, but here we are like this. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so usage during during family times, and uh, that's that's one thing that um, that will that we'll talk about. That is one of those areas that um, may take some hard work on the front end to be kind of countercultural and create and shape those spaces for our families, but will be worth it in the end whenever we can have those those good conversations. That those are all those are all really good. I, a, a personal story recently, um, you know, I, I work with, with students and, um, you know, just to, just to illustrate the, the good and the bad of technology in one instance, we were meeting uh, with a small group, we, I disciple a couple of guys and, um, and they, uh, we all used our phones, an app called Versus that's really good, we all memorized a whole chapter of scripture together. Uh, using using our phones and using technology and then right I mean right after we had quoted all of Philippians 2 and it was awesome and then we're having these conversations and and uh, you know and, and diving deep into scripture and it's amazing and then all of a sudden this guy's Apple watch dings and then he's distracted from the conversation right so we just used we used technology for something that was really good. We memorized scripture together. It was positive, and then immediately, really in the same breath, technology is distracting us and uh, and is drawing us away from something that that uh, we we you know that we're striving after. Um, so yeah, so um, there there's a couple there's a couple books. There's one that. Later, pretty much everything I'm going to say came from this book called TechWise Family by Andy Crouch. And uh, this, this, in my estimation, is the best book. It's called TechWise Family by Andy Crouch. TechWise Family. It is the best as far as um, shaping our whole family, how to think about... Um, 
how to think about our whole families, ways to create spaces for our families to think about technology and to be tech wise. I think it is the best book out there for us and for you guys that, um, that probably have younger kids and uh, for me and my wife as well, we had, we're expecting our first kid at the end of August. So we're thinking about all of these things and, uh, and it's important for us. So we, we've already put into practice some of these things that I'll talk about a little later, but this is the best book um, I think for this conversation uh, that, that I, ta I have taken a lot of what I'll share later from, from this and um, I need to give him credit from the, from the beginning. And then um, there's another book called 12 Ways Your Phone Is Changing You by a guy named Tony Ranke. Uh, 12 ways your phone is changing you and um, and he asks and he poses the question what is the best use of my smartphone in the flourishing of my life so we need to answer that personally as parents um, because we need to model for our kids the best way to use technology and to use our phones um, so if we from the beginning can begin to think through these issues. Okay, what is the best use of technology? What is the best use of my smartphone uh, for the, be the betterment of my personal life, my flourishing, my discipleship, my becoming more like Jesus? How can I best use my phone to, to make those things happen? And then when we can answer that question and we have that kind of um, nailed down as parents, then we're going to model that for our kids. We have to answer that for our kids and for our families. What is the best way for our kids to use or not to use technology to make them better followers of Jesus? And then we need to disciple them in it. So our two texts from earlier, uh, Deuteronomy 6 and then Matthew 28 as well, um, kind of, I, I think, give us some diagnostic questions that might be good for our families. Uh, so the first one, just from those as well, a question that we could ask is, is this use of technology leading our family to have conversations about God and His Word? Is, is our use of technology leading us to have conversations about God and His Word? So if Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, if we take it, if we take it literally, which I believe we should, um, everything, everywhere we go, uh, when we wake up, when we sit down, when we walk by the way, everything should be an opportunity or can be an opportunity for us to direct things back to God. Um, so this is where the use of technology is not inherently evil. Um, it's not bad for you and your family to go to a movie and, um, and, and watch a movie and enjoy it for leisure. That's perfectly fine. That's great. That's a, that's a gift of God. But how do we then take the content from that movie um, and have conversations with our kids about some of the things that we saw? Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, of uh, messages that are being sent by the even kids' movies that we watch that we need to, that we need to discern and, um, and figure out what those messages are and then have those conversations with our kids, even the little ones from first through fifth grade. Um, we, can, we can talk about uh, the things of God just based on the things that we, that we take in. Um, so is this use of technology leading our family to have conversations about God and His Word? Um, Another question, is this use of technology spiritually beneficial for my kid? Like I said, um, fun and enjoyment is good to a point. I'm not saying that we need to trash all the Xboxes and the Playstations, like the, the video games that we're talking about. I don't think we need to do that necessarily, but I do want us to think about it, to put time limits on it. What games are they playing? Do we know the content of those games? And is there anything redemptive in them? Um, you know, are they played in community? You know, a lot of the, a lot of, a lot of the kids that I talk to are like, well, we're playing with groups of friends, you know, we're having conversations over the, you know, over the internet or whatever. And um, so, okay, uh, but still, let's put some, some time limits, some, some, um, you know, let's, let's think about it. Let's, um, how much time are they spending? Are, is there addictive, um, you know, tendencies, and uh, are they are they showing, um, you know, that there's there's a pattern of addiction there? Are we spending too much time on it? And then um, 
Yeah, and in, is there anything redemptive in the game that we can talk about and connect back to the things of God? Those are all questions that, that we can see because, like I said earlier in Deuteronomy 6, parents being commanded to talk about the things of God all the time. So, things we enjoy via technology such as movie, music, video games, etc., they should all have some way of teaching our kids about the things of God through them and if not, if there's nothing redemptive uh, that we can find, then we should think about totally getting rid of them. And again, a lot of these things are going to be countercultural as well. So um, I've done a lot of... I've, there's, there's a few different books that contain a lot of research that, um, that I've done, so you don't have to. Um, and... Uh, and one of them is called Gen Z uh, that just came out by uh, the Barna study group. And I think um, for right now, your, your kids, the first through fifth graders, are still being lumped into this generation. So I, all of this research uh, pretty well applies. Um, and then there's a lot of research on teenagers now as well. Um, that uh, is very interesting for us to, to look at and, and see. Um, and I think that all of these findings, that uh, all of this research that these people have done cannot be separated from the fact that all of these kids have grown up uh, as what we call digital natives or always having the, knowing the, that they've always had screens, they've grown up and they, they speak the language of technology and, uh, and I think that these findings cannot be separated from that fact. So, um, in one of the big studies in a book called iGen, um, Eric Geiger, uh, this guy, he distilled it down to the things that characterize this generation. So I'll just give you the, I'll just give you the, the topic headings um, and I won't, I won't dive down deep. But here are the things that characterized this generation, this generation that has grown up uh, with, with knowing nothing but screens and, and having uh, technology at their fingertips all the time. Here's what characterizes this generation. One, less reading, less happiness, less social skills, less community, and they're less mentally healthy. So those, those five things characterized this generation uh, that have, has constantly uh, had technology at their fingertips, um, which is scary. Um, so they don't read as much as other generations. They're less happy. Um, so eighth graders who spent 10 or more hours a week on social media are 56% more likely to be unhappy than those who don't. Less social skills, um, not surprising, but those who stare at their phones all day during their formative years will struggle to interact relationally with others, right? So if we're constantly looking at our phones, looking at a screen, then we have more difficulty having a one-on-one -on -one conversation where there's real, um, there's real personal interaction and, and eye contact in a conversation. Uh, so this generation's ability to connect is, is taking its toll. Less community. Um, this generation is l more lonely than previous generations. On average, loneliness increases as social media use increases. Um, so uh, again, it's, it's interesting to see that uh, this generation is more connected than any other generation, yet they're more lonely. So we're seeing that the more technology use, the more social media use, the act actually the more, um, the more lonely they are and less connected they are as far as real meaningful relationships um, are, um, are. So, and then the last one, less mentally healthy, and this one's, this one's scary. With more loneliness, more comparisons, more anxiety, it's not surprising that iGen is a less mentally healthy group compared to previous generations. Um, and uh, and here, you know, here's, here's the sticking point. The sudden sharp rise in depressive symptoms occurs as almost exactly the same time that smartphones became ubiquitous and in-person interaction plummeted. So at the same time, you can look at the research and say, as soon as smartphones were synonymous, like as soon as everybody had a smartphone, depression uh, rates rise at, at the exact same time. So um, 
So all of the all of this research would go to show us and tell us that okay maybe um, maybe giving our kids and for us to have unfettered access to smartphones all the time was maybe not the best use of uh, of technology. I think we all know that, and as Christians, this is uh, kind of my personal conviction. I think that we let technology happen to us instead of taking biblical principles and what the scripture has to say and imposing it on to technology. And uh, I think now we're going, uh uh-oh, we're seeing all the negative effects and we're going, okay, how do we recover from this? Um, Which is great and and, and amazing that you guys are here to to learn about these things because we need to have a plan for our families uh, from the beginning while our kids are, are younger now. Uh, and impose some of these rules and help them think about technology in a healthy way. Um, Some more research, and this is from the Gen Z Barna uh, deal. Um, So 57% use screen media four hours a day or more. Um, Many admit to having experienced (laughs) nomophobia, a feeling of anxiety anytime they're separated from their mobile phone. Um, So again, this research is maybe uh, for uh, on the kids that are a little older than your kids, but they are they're digital natives. So it's the this is really the same kind of group of people that we're talking about. And I and I had this happen. um, I saw another personal experience and story in our freshman department. So these are 13, 14 year olds. um, Our department director encouraged all of the kids to put their phones away like you know, put them under your, your seat and give whoever was speaking their undivided attention. And he saw one girl do this. Instead of putting it uh, under her seat, she, she did this. She put it under her, under her uh, shirt like this. So it was still on her body, uh, but she wasn't actually, like, she, she didn't have to put it down to where it wasn't actually touching her. Um, and that's indicative of the way that they feel and what this is saying, that, this is, that our phones have essentially become a part of who we are. It's, it's, we, can't, we can't operate without them. And, uh, and for our kids, uh, probably a lot of us feel, I feel that way sometimes. You know, we, leave, we forget our phone at home and all of a sudden we feel naked. Um, and, and the kids that have grown up with these things especially feel that way. Um, they, they, would, they would keep it on their body at all times if, if possible. Um, here, here's an interesting thing. Teens right now are less likely, less likely to leave their homes to drink alcohol and to get their driver's license and go out on dates than generations before them. They're less likely to do all those things. Interesting. Uh, we may be like, yeah, okay, that's a good thing. Um, but if it's at the expense of their mental health and their uh, connection with other, with other people and connection with our families as well, then maybe all of those things are not necessarily a good thing. Yeah, we don't, we don't want them to, to, to drink and to do things that are dishonoring to the Lord, but it's interesting that um, all of this coincides with the use of, of technology. Um, a couple more things that are, you know, that, that might help us think about these issues. Um, hours on social media each day, um, 31% said four to eight hours, and these are teenagers. 31% were on social media four to eight hours a day, and 26% were on social media eight or more hours a day. That's over half. It's insane. Um, <clears throat> so, you, you know... You know all these things. I'll, I'll skip. I'll skip a lot of this because we're we need to talk about kind of younger, uh, younger kids and and our families and how we can we can shape our things. But we know that technology is addictive. Okay, we know we know this. Um, one one uh, one of the researchers he likened giving an adolescent a phone to giving them access to an alcohol cabinet in adolescence. So we, we really, all we can see now is the results of what, what, this, what has happened uh, for us giving, giving kids phones in, in adolescence. Um, we're just now seeing what the, uh, what the effects are 
and some of the researchers are telling us this is just as giving giving an adolescent a phone with unfettered access is just as dangerous as just unlocking the liquor cabinet and 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 saying go for it <laughs> which is which is scary because it's it's having untold effects on on our kids um, and I'm sure you've heard this before, but Steve Jobs, the guy that, that created iPads, um, he wouldn't let his kids have an iPad at home. Um, so, and, and Bill Gates, uh, the guy, the Microsoft guy that created so much of our technology, uh, he wouldn't let his kid have a phone until they were 14. Okay? So if the people that are creating these technologies and making all the money off of us uh, have thought about and, and they know the addictive nature of technology and they know the effects that it can have on people, um, then we should, we should really be thinking through these things and when and how long we give our kids access to technology. Okay. So we talked about some of the positive things that we can use technology to disciple our kids in. Um, we can send and provide good resources, podcasts, videos um, that are instructive, informative, that are biblical, that are good. Those are all good uses of technology. And we do all these things um, with our students and with our kids already. Um, we use them to connect with them personally, to know what they're doing, to keep up with them. Those are all those are all good things as well and, and ways to use technology. Um, and, uh, you know, there's other apps and stuff that are really good that help us memorize scripture, that keep prayer requests and all those things. We, we use all those things here at the church and, uh, and in our families as well. Um, so what we have to do is, um, is to teach our kids about technology from as young an age as possible and to help them think through um, their use of technology. And again, I've said this over and over again that we're, we've got to be countercultural uh, in this area as Christians. And, um, but that's the nature of following Jesus. Following Jesus has always been a countercultural thing. We, we've always needed to look different from what the rest of the world is doing. And this area, technology in our, in our families, is no, is no different. Um, so we have to have these types of conversations and talk about the dangers of technology and, uh, and what, it, what it can do to our kids. And uh, we, we have to understand those things. And then we, we need to, as parents, as parents, we need to model what it looks like uh, to have healthy tech, a healthy balance in use of technology as well. Um, and this is this is scary for us who probably are fighting addictive tendencies to our own phones and use of technology as well. But this is huge for us as parents. Um, if your kid only sees the camera pointed at them and half of your face behind that camera. Uh, throughout their their uh, you know their formative growing up years as a kid, who knows what kind of toll that that's taking and what what the effects are going to be later on. We we still don't really know yet, uh, but I can't imagine that it's going to be a positive one. Uh, if from the time they you you know your kids are are infants, the only thing that they see is is uh, your phone camera pointed at them and half your face behind that that camera. Um, that's got to be dangerous, you know. And and uh, we can we can chuckle about it because it's true. Uh, but who knows? Um, who knows what kind of damage that's causing? Uh, you know, again, not saying that taking pictures is in and of itself a bad thing, uh, but if we spend more time behind our phones than we do um, having eye contact, face-to-face, -face physical interaction, and showing our kids that we love them, um, not from behind a phone, uh, if we're if we've inverted those, that's a negative thing. So we need to model what it looks like to have a healthy use of technology and build those things into our families as uh, from from the beginning, because our kids can see us. And uh, from a young age, even from infancy on, uh, they, they notice and they pick up on things. Uh, you, you know that, I mean, if you've got, I'm sure all of you have, have young kids that can just, they can pick up a phone and they can do stuff on there when, no, you didn't teach them that, uh, but they can do it. 
and so they, they can pick up on things without us even teaching them how to do it. So um, that's, that's kind of the, the scary thing where we as parents need to model uh, healthy, healthy technology use and we need to get real about it and, uh, and fight um, addiction to technology ourselves and model it well. Okay. So we have some really mean and some really strict parents here at church, and I love it, okay? Um, so some of, some of, and uh, I'm going to talk, I'm going to give you the 10 things that, that he says here in a little bit, and we'll wrap up with that, and then we'll take questions. But here are some of the things that, that's, uh, to get real practical, here are some of the things that I have seen some of our families do that I think are, are really good, and, uh, and, and, Again, the kids might not uh, appreciate it all the time, but they will whenever they're older and uh, they have a healthy view of, of technology. Um, some of our parents do things like this. No phones upstairs at all. Um, use, the use of technology is only uh, in uh, like family areas. Uh, so a lot of our parents won't let uh, kids use technology um, outside of um, a pl like basically the area where your whole family will be. So, so no, no phone usage or no iPad usage or whatever technology you might have in your home. They don't let them take them, take them upstairs. Um, and this is great, especially when your kids get older, if you, if you uh, allow them to have a cell phone. Um, there's all kinds of, of negative effects that, that it can have if you, if you allow your kids um, to have them in bed uh, and they can scroll through whatever for endless amount of hours. Uh, it's, not, it's just not healthy. We don't get good sleep if we're, and this is for us too. Um, all these things could be good for us. So no phones upstairs, that's great. Um, no phones past 8 p.m. Uh, ha, has has been one, and th these are, these have been for older kids, but we can we can um, we can take some of these principles as well, and then um, and then also our parents um, when they when they do it best, they have full, complete, total access to everything on on the their kids' phone or their technology that they use as well. Um, <clears throat> one thing that was interesting is that uh, from some of this research, parents. Uh, majority of parents, all, uh, they agree that uh, parenting is more difficult today than it was when they were kids. Would you all agree with that? Yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, the number one reason that most parents would say is because of technology. Uh, and, and technology and social media. So, um, I, I mentioned earlier that... Um, I'll just mention this in, in passing because it's such it's a much bigger conversation. Um, but hey, guys, come in. Um, so exposure to um, and uh, e exposure to um, pornography, uh, bad images um, on online. What the research is saying now is that most kids are exposed at the age of eight. Eight. That's the that's the late, and it might be it it might be younger now, but that, those are the last um, those are the last numbers that I that I saw. Um, and again, <clears throat> so that that just goes to show the types of conversations that we need to be having with our kids and the type of. Um, openness and uh, honesty and vulnerability that we need to try and create uh, in our families and to talk about uh, th those types of images and things that can really affect our kids, um, which, you know, eight is probably, uh, what, what grade is it? Second or third? Yeah. So, so that's, uh, that's when the average, the average kid is being exposed to those types of images. And, um, and so we need to be uh, just on the front end of that and to have those types of conversations and ask those kinds of questions and, uh, and, and to talk in such a way that, that can be helpful uh, for, for our kids. We have to talk about it and we have to fight it. Um, so those that, just so you guys are aware that, um, that that's, what, that's when most of our kids are, are being exposed to um, those, those types of images, okay? 
So I talked about TechWise family. We got a few minutes left, and uh, and I just want to read. I'm going to give you. Um, so there there are three. This guy Andy Crouch. He said there are three choices that they made as a family, and then there are ten commitments that they made as well. Um, and these. So I would still encourage you to get the book and to read it. But I'm going to tell you. Uh, I'm just going to share with you now some of the gold that I found from this book. So th this is real, just like practical stuff for, for your family. And like I said earlier, this is the best book I know on the subject. I would encourage you all to get it and read it and implement everything that it says. And, uh, and uh, these are some of the things that uh, were most helpful for me and for my wife and things that we're going to implement now as we're uh, going to be having our, our first child in August. So we want to get out ahead of these things and I would encourage you to as well. Um, so the first thing uh, that's important is we're not, I'm not advocating that we go Amish, okay? Uh, we can still use technology, but we need to commit to what's most important, uh, which is making disciples and talking about the things of God in our, in our families, okay? And uh, that our family is pursuing Jesus together, okay? So these are the three choices that are fundamental for parents to make according to, according to Andy Crouch. He says this, the first thing is this, choose character. Choose character. He says, to make the mission of our family for children and adults alike the cultivation, the cultivation of wisdom and courage. So he, he wants our families to choose character. Always make the decision uh, that is going to bring about more wisdom and more courage. Okay? And you can you could uh, imagine what the opposite of that would look like if all we all do all the time is sit on our phones and consume, 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 consume. Uh, via technology, there's no cultivation of wisdom. There's no cultivation of courage. There's no, there's no imagination. There's no stepping out and doing things together as a family and challenging our kids uh, to do hard things and to, you know, and, and to, you know, go go climb that tree and go, you know, go dribble that that ball around and go shoot those hoops and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we want to we want to choose character. We want to. Um, as a, as a family, we want to do the things that are going to, to kind of draw us out and, and to make us, uh, to, to cultivate wisdom and courage, okay? The second choice, he said, is to shape space. To shape space. And this looks like to make choices about the place we live and put the development of character, I put Christ-likeness, and creativity at the heart of our home. Make choices about the place we live that put the development of Christ-likeness and creativity at the heart of our home. And for him, this is what this looks like. They do not have a television in their living room. Okay, They have a TV, but it's not at the place where their family spends most of their time. What he's done is he's, he's shaped the space where their family spends most of their time, and he puts things there uh, that cultivate creativity. Okay, and some of these things might be a little more costly, and some of them are super cheap. Okay, so in their living room, this is what they've done they've put uh, bookshelves there, <laughs> and they've put a bunch of books in their living room to cultivate reading and uh, creativity and the use of imagination. Uh, they've put a, uh, a piano in their living room to cultivate, again, creativity um, and, uh, and, and music there at the heart of their home. And then uh, also they put art up on the walls of, of those homes that cultivate creativity. Um, so they, they challenge their kids to create art and they'll put the art up on the wall and display, look what you've done. You, you created this thing and we're celebrating the creativity that you have shown. So we want to shape the spaces in our homes to cultivate creativity and not, uh, not just breed more uh, consumption, okay? So they shape those spaces uh, to put the development of Christ-likeness and creativity at the heart of their home. So that's something that we've, we've done in, in my house. We, uh, we, we have a television, but we took it out of the living room, um, which has been really cool. Again, it's countercultural. People are like, where's your TV? We're like, it's, you know, it's in this other room. We watch it when we want to watch a movie, and, that, and that's it. 
It's not just constantly on and, and running and that's been really good for us because it creates spaces for us to actually have conversations and, uh, and, and uh, so that's, that's something that, that's been really good for us that I've actually employed. And then the third choice that he says is to structure time. Structure time. To build rhythms into our daily lives on a daily, weekly, and annual basis that make it possible for us to get to know one another, God, and our world in deeper and deeper ways. So, um, he, uh, I'll, I'll flesh out, and in his commitments, he, he gets to how he does that, but he structures, he structures the time of their family to, to create ways for them to disconnect from their phones and to get to know one another and, uh, and their world in a deeper way, okay? So here are the 10 TechWise commitments from Andy Crouch in TechWise family, okay? Uh, number one is we develop wisdom and courage together as a family. We develop wisdom and courage together as a family. Um, again, this is, this is more uh, from the, a parent's kind of leadership role and encouraging their kids uh, to do difficult things, to have uh, conversations about, about decisions that they make and, and decisions that they make as a family. Uh, so their, their commitment is to develop wisdom and courage together as a family. And that fleshes out in different ways um, that you can, you can read in, in their book as well. The second thing is he says, we want to create more than we consume. So I already said this, but they fill the center of their home with things that reward skill and active engagement. Okay? I, think, I hope you've already thought about it, but what, uh, what does your home communicate about what's most important to your family? Uh, what, do, what do you spend the majority of your time doing? Uh, what, what is at the center of your home? And uh, probably it's, uh, you know, for us for a long time, it was, it was the use of, of technology and just consumption. Uh, so we want to kind of flip that and make the most important thing or what is central um, active engagement and we want to reward skill uh, which for your kids might be art, you know, creating a space for them to, to draw, to color, to do crafts, uh, you know, to, to do some things that reward that creativity. Um, all right, number three, number three commitment, he says, we are designed for a rhythm of work and rest. So here's what they do. One hour a day, one day a week, and one week a year, they turn off their devices. Okay? So one hour a day, one day a week, and one week a year, they create a space where everybody turns off all of the technology in their phones and they're all in with each other. One hour a day, one day a week, and then one week a year as well. So obviously you can, you can keep it handy for emergencies and, and that sort of thing, but again, these, are, these are spaces that we're creating uh, for, for work and for rest. And so we need, we need to take breaks from, from our technology. We all need it, and we can use those times to, to connect with our, our families and, uh, and have conversations as well. Um, the fourth thing is this, another real practical thing. We wake up before our devices do and they go to bed before we do. We wake up before our devices do and they go to bed before we do. This is something that I've tried to do as well and implement in my life. It's difficult, it's not always easy, uh, but I don't charge my phone um, right next to my head. <laughs> uh, so I, I got a real old fashioned analog alarm clock and it's the annoying bell thing, but it wakes me up. And then uh, what I try and do, and what he advocates for in the book, and this would be really good for you and your family as well, uh, is he just, they, they just take 10 minutes whenever they wake up before anybody touches their phones or touches any sort of technology. So it's just creating that little space where, okay, the first thing I do every day is not immediately look at, at my phone and look at what notifications I have. And um, you know, this, this is probably easier if you've got younger kids to where the first thing that they do is not gonna be to grab their phones, but it's something that we can begin to model. And, uh, and uh, we go to bed before our phones do, so we put them up and and then we wake up, they wake up after, after we do, okay? Um, the fifth thing, here's what they say, we are for no screens before double digits at school and at home, okay? This is what they strive for, again, they, they've, you know, he admits that they've failed a few times in this, but 
uh, they've, they've thought it best and most wise to try and um, limit screen usage before double digits at school and at home, which is difficult for us uh, because a lot of our school districts around here are all in for technology and are, you know, are doing iPads and stuff which all the technology is now saying that that doesn't actually help learning at all. Uh, so maybe we'll see a swing back the other direction. Uh, but really the idea is we want to limit the amount of screen usage the younger the kids are. And uh, we want to we monitor that. Um, number six, we use screens for a purpose and we use them together rather than using them aimlessly and alone. So again, this kind of goes to uh, you know, if we're playing video games, like, you know, dad, mom, dad, let's, uh, let's do it together for a set amount of time and let's talk about the things that are happening or whatever. Let's, let's use screens uh, for a purpose and we use them together rather than aimlessly and alone. Number seven, his commitment, car time is conversation time. Pretty simple. Um, number eight, spouses have one another's passwords and parents have total access to children's devices. Uh, again, I hope, I hope most of us are, are doing this already, but it's just wise to have total access to everything that your kid has on their iPad or whatever technology they're using. Um, number nine, uh, this, is, this is an interesting one. He says, we learn to sing together rather than letting recorded and amplified music take over our lives in worship. So, do you ever just sing together as a family um, without, the, without singing along with other um, technology usage? And then the last thing is this, that he says, we show up in person for the big events of life. We learn how to be human by being fully present at our moments of greatest vulnerability, and we hope to die in one another's arms. <laughs> So this, that's more for that's more for uh, you know parents. That's not much for kids. But but we're gonna we're gonna show up and we're gonna be fully present for one another and we're gonna be real with each other in the big moments of life. Um, so those are those are the ten commitments uh, from TechWise family that I think are are really good. So the main takeaway is we need to have a plan. I would encourage you guys. We, we're running out of time here, and I want to I want to get you guys out. Um, but I would, I would love if the result of this would be that you and your spouse or your family, whoever, you come up with some of those things that you guys are going to commit to. Um, like, like, okay, because the biggest thing I think is for us as Christians, we need to have a plan. We need to be out in front of it and we need to impose our biblical worldview and our Christianity, we need to impose it onto our technology usage. That's the most important thing for us. We need to get out in front of it. We need to have a good understanding of technology and then we need to make commitments as a family about how we're going to use technology as well. So I would encourage you guys to, to leave here today to talk and to pray with your family and come up with some guidance lines of how we're going to use technology as a family. We're going to, you know, we're going to employ the, we're going to take the TV out of our living room, we're going to move it to another room, and we're only going to watch the TV when we're doing it as a family. Something like that. Um, or we're going to, um, you know, we're all going to charge our phones on the, you know, on the island in the, in the kitchen. We're not going to take them to our beds. You know, we're just going to make that commitment as a family. We're going to spend one hour Hour. We're gonna we're not gonna have our phones at the dinner table no matter how difficult it may be, and we're gonna use the meal times to, to not be on our phones. Car times are gonna be conversation times. We're not gonna have our phones during the times we're in the car, and we're gonna talk as a family and, and talk about the things of God, um, et cetera, et cetera. I would love if the, the result of this is for you guys to take a few of those things and implement those with your own family. Okay, does that sound good? Awesome. All right, I'll hang around for a little bit. It's 1015. If you want to talk, Leonard will be here. Dre's in the back as well. He's one of our pastors. Uh, we, can, we can have some more conversation if you guys want, but I'm going to pray for us and then, and then we'll get going. Okay. Father, thank you so much for these, uh, these parents and, and grandparents and the families in this room that are represented. And we ask uh, that you would give us wisdom, Lord, when it comes to the use of technology. We know that these things can be used for good, it can be used for the cultivation of our walk with you. God, and we pray that you would give us wisdom to use it in those ways that we would use technology to grow deeper in our knowledge and our love for you. 
and you would shape us to be more like your son as a, as a result of technology. God, and I pray that if there's any difficult com uh, conversations or difficult decisions that need to be made as a result uh, of today and our usage of technology, that we would make those knowing that um, it's going to be for the good of our family in the end uh, as we seek to honor you in everything that we do, Lord. So I thank you again for these parents. Give us all wisdom as, uh, as we seek to navigate these difficult times. Um, God, we need you and, and, uh, and you alone to, to guide us, God. So we love you, and I thank you again. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.